Miracles, miracles. Uh, the suspension of the natural to something that is supernatural. That's a miracle. And how the Lord works miracles in our heart are multiple ways. I believe me. I've seen the Lord work miracles in my life that obviously were just uh, uh, the opposite almost of what I might have imagined it to be. It's, uh, it's amazing how God can answer our prayers and strengthen us and move us and, and, um, and work in us and, and how God can take something that can be so negative and work it out to the benefit of everybody involved. Uh, you know, it's not, a, it's not you, you get a win and somebody else gets a loss. It's like a win and they get a win and you, you know, and it's a win-win situation and God just miraculously does things that are so supernatural that we can only say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for working that out. That's a, that's a miracle of God. So we pray for that and the Spirit of the Lord indwells a place you can sense that. You can, you, can, you can sense it in your spirit that God's there and that there's something unusual about the atmosphere. And, uh, yeah. and, and you begin to sense that he's going to speak to your heart and say things and do things in you that you've been asking about and needing and wanting for a long time. And, uh, and just pray that the Lord, like today, will just take whatever it is that he's ministering here through this word, this book of James we've been in for Gosh, I don't know what, about uh, two or three months now altogether. <laughs> yeah, five chapters. <laughs> Man, what if it had like 20 chapters? It'd be, woo, that'd be tough, wouldn't it? Yeah, we plan to go, I plan to go into the book of Revelation next. Uh, of course, obviously, I won't be starting that on the Easter Sunday. Uh, we have one more, one more thought in the book of James after we finish today. And it is in those, um, those six verses that are before verse 19 and 20 in chapter 5. We've, you might have noticed, if some of you have looked at the outline, you know, we start in chapter 5 and then we kind of just go through it, go through it, go through it, and then boom, there's about six verses we skip over and go to the last two to keep the thought, to keep the flow of, of that thought of what he's saying together. But those six verses there talk about something different. It talks about how to pray for, for yourself and how to pray for others, for healing, for uh, restoration, for whatever God might, God's purpose might be. And so we'll talk about faith healing. We'll talk about praying for others and praying for yourself and what that means. And what, I mean, that'll be next week uh, as we finish up the book of James and then Easter and then uh, prayerfully. <laughs> and I say that... I say prayerfully and hopefully uh, the book of Revelation will start after that and we'll be in it for a while. Yeah. And what I intend to do is uh, most likely um, I, I plan to, of course, obviously start the book and go through chapters 2 and 3, which are letters to churches, which are very, um, very current with what's happening in churches now and and what the Lord would say to us all and different kind of aspects and views of what God wants and says and, and expects and what, what church will be like and what church the church needs to hear from Christ. And then chapter 4, when he calls us away, and from 4 through 19, you know, there come scenes during a period of time where there's great, where there's tribulation and great tribulation on earth. Once we get to the calling away, uh, I might switch switch the teaching of Revelation to Sunday night. I don't know that for sure. We'll just see how it goes. You know, I don't want you to get burnt out on it. And uh, of course, obviously, you can't you can't you know just uh, you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna just you know try to preach it to death and and get every little tiny thing. But I want to I want to show you what it's really talking about and what it means because after all it is the revelation. Yeah, yeah. The revelation means the unveiling. In other words, God wants us to know this. Yeah. In the book of Daniel, the Bible says God sealed up some word, some prophecy, and He said, "Seal up the book." In other words, you're not going to know anything. You're not going to know about this because this part is not for you. You're going to write things, and it's going to matter in some other time, but it's not going to matter now, so I'm not going to give you the wisdom and the spirit to understand these things. So seal up the book 
for this is written for another day. But when the book of Revelation comes along, it is the opening of that book. It is the unveiling of that book because God says, I want you to know. I want you to see what this is. I'm going to give you the ability to understand this and receive this and, and be a part of this because this is something you need. And so I just want to encourage you that you need to say within yourself, I can receive this. I can understand this. Don't think of confusion and don't think of, uh, you know, some mystery thing. Think, God wrote this to me. God wants me to know this. And God will open my mind and I can receive this and it will speak to my heart. And so I just ask you to kind of prepare yourself as we go toward that. But first of all, let's see what Brother James has to say to us for this, uh, these last couple of, couple of verses that we didn't get to last week in, in consideration of uh, real faith in the return of Jesus. James is a book about real faith. It's a book about somebody, the difference between somebody who talks a good game and, the different, and somebody who is a real spiritual Christian believer. And the argument of James is that you can tell the difference really simply by looking at the way their life is lived. In other words, uh, it's not a matter of uh, praying some magic prayer. It's not a matter of saying the right words because all of us can learn the words that we're supposed to say to invite Christ into our life. You know, we can say with our mouth, I surrender to you, Jesus. I wave the white flag. I give it up. And Lord, come into my heart and save my soul. You are my Lord and I am your servant. You know, we can say that to the Lord and, and then our life begins to reflect that, that that's true salvation. We say that to the Lord, and then we continue to live our own willful way, our own selfish life, not led by God, obviously not surrendered to God, not submitted like we said we were. And James just says, look, guys, it's really important that you understand and you know where you stand with the Lord because one of these days you'll stand before the Lord, and when you do, it's going to be too late to change then and wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to know that before you stand before the Lord, you know that you are real. And so James says things like faith without works is dead. A faith that's strong enough to save your soul is strong enough to change the way you live. And if the way you live haven't, hasn't changed, then you need, you need to make sure that you've surrendered. You need, to, you need to get right with God. You need to get real in your life. And, and brother, that's just where the rubber meets the road. That's just all it, what, that's what it's about. It's about my life and my relationship with God and, and how that reveals itself. And, and remember, James is writing to a church. Every bit of this writing in the book of James is written to my brethren, Every time James, I mean, James says, my brethren or brethren in every chapter two or three times, identifying the fact that he's talking to these believers that are also Jews that have been his Jewish brethren and his now Christian brethren that are part of a church. And, and, and so you have to keep reminding yourself when you hear some of these words that James is writing this to a church. I mean, these are words not written to some pagan heathen outside the church. These are words written to people who are supposed to be God's people, who are supposed to be Christians. And you see really some challenging things about wars and where come wars and fightings among, the, among you. Come they not from your own lust that war in your members. You lust and you have not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you might consume it on yourselves. I mean, my goodness, that's a word to Christian people. Yeah. Whew. Man, that's a word from the Lord. Yeah. That's a convicting word to all of us who are called children of God. We realize and we know this, that all of our church, that everybody that sits in this building is not surrendered to the Lord. That even though you may come to church, you, you know, some of you are real and some of you are not real. I mean, the sad reality is that, is some of you are not real. And I'm not trying to scare you because I don't know, I mean, you know, I, the only part of your life I have any insight in is how you look on Sunday, you know? Now, a few of you I know, and I've been around you somewhat, but most of you, I just see you on Sunday. 
And you look beautiful. You look just spiritual. You look so good sitting there, you know, nice and clothed. And, and you ladies have your makeup on, which I thank the Lord for. And, um, yeah, I thank the Lord. I love makeup. And, um, and anyway, uh, anyway you, you look wonderful, you know. And, and so my judgment of you would be, wow, what a, what a spiritual person. What a, what a godly person. So I don't know who might not know the Lord, and I'm really not trying to accuse anybody. The, the odds are, I mean, it's just the odds. The odds are that there are people who sit here but are, but are not real. And so James says, let's examine this so that you can see yourself, so you can do what is necessary, so you don't stand before the Lord one day and find and hear him say to you, depart from me, you worker of sin, for I never knew you. Not I knew you once and you got away, or I knew you once but you couldn't hold on, or I knew you once and you wiggled out of my hand. No, you, I never knew you. You never have belonged to me. And so we, we want to make sure, right? I mean, that would be a good thing to know. And so James gives us words not to discourage us, but to encourage us about this. Now, James is, is the half-brother of Jesus that came to, came to faith in Jesus when Jesus appeared to him after the resurrection. And he spoke to James, and this book was written as one of the first books written that have gone into the New Testament it's kind of at the end in your Bible. You know, we've talked about that. If you have your Bible and you open your Bible, James will be toward the end of the New Testament. But really, it belongs in chronological order toward the front because it's one of the first ones that were written before any of the Gospels and before uh, any of Paul's writings because Paul was not even saved at the time James was writing and Paul had not gone on any missionary jersey, journeys and there were... Maybe, I mean, who knows, maybe a handful of Gentiles had been saved, but everybody was Jews. And so uh, James says, all right, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, greetings in the name of the Lord. And to my brothers and my, you know, my brethren, hear this word and receive this word. And he, and he comes to chapter 5, and, and after all of the stuff that he said, he said, listen, Jesus is going to come back. He, when he left here, he said he was going to come back, and he promised to come back. And everybody from the time Jesus left the earth felt like Jesus would come back in their generation. Everybody. I know as we sit here, if I ask you, I said, how many of you believe Jesus is going to come before you taste death? You would probably raise your hand. You'd say, surely he's going to come. I mean, some of you have, you know, 50, 60, 70 years or more left on this earth before you would go away naturally. And you would be thinking, man, surely it can't get worse than this. Surely the signs of the times and the ages and the, and the prophecy and the fulfillment of prophecy, surely we've come to that point where, you know, Jesus is, is right on the threshold of, of stepping out of heaven and stepping into the clouds in the air, Thessalonians says. His feet, you know, he will, he, he will call us up off of this earth. You know, his feet won't touch the earth. It will touch it at some point after the tribulation at the end when he, when he steps on the mount and it splits down the middle and, and, and the battle of Armageddon and it, words go out of his mouth. But this time it will be a secret coming. It will only, it'll only be known by those who know him where, where he steps into the clouds and we rise, the dead in Christ rise first and then we who are with him rise with them in the Lord to meet the Lord in the air, Thessalonians says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So James says, that's real. Believe that. That's going to happen. And so in the light of that happening, how are we to live as believers in Jesus? What are our lives supposed to be like in preparation for that tremendous event to happen because it is going to happen. James believed it would happen in, at any moment. So did the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul believed that he would never see death before the Lord came. Every generation from then until now believed that. 
I believe that. I, you know, I believe that I will be alive when Jesus comes. I, I thought it might have been the year 2000. That might have been it, you know. I'm born in 56. As, you know, I'm, I'm on up there. Uh, our children have graduated from high school and, and before 2000. And, you know, I mean, it just when I, when, when I was young, it seemed like a long way. And I said, surely Jesus will come at that tremendous time and so forth. And there were prophecies and there were people adding up times and times and number of times in 2,000 years and 2,000 years and 2,000 years, and it made perfect sense that Jesus, whoo, Jesus was going to come. Well, you know, it's 2018, and he still tarries. And we all have that sense that, my goodness, man, how bad could it get? Because we see every day in our lives just tremendous turmoil on the world scene. Man, things are just drastically, ridiculously hostile. Christianity is being killed. Christians are being, are being martyred and slain and driven out. Even in our own country, to be a Christian is to be, is to be ridiculed and mocked and, and, to be, and to be taken advantage of. I mean, rules and things that used to be uh, uh, moved toward Christianity are now turned just the opposite, you know? Uh, other religions can have their freedoms, but we as Christians have to take our stuff down and, and can't do the things, I mean, we can't even pray almost in public anymore because it's been so ridiculous and we're going, could it get worse than this? Well, this is the way the Lord described these end days when he was asking Matthew, Lord, what is going to be the sign of your coming and when shall the end be? And he said, you are, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars and, you know, don't let your hearts be troubled. We're in a day of tremendous unrest and wars everywhere. Wars planning to be there, outbreaks planning to be there. I mean, there's just a number of wars all over the earth, probably the, the most, uh, the most uh, hostile time on the earth with nation against nation. And civil war, kingdom against kingdom, that means civil war, one nation fighting itself. But let not your heart be troubled because the end is not yet, Jesus said. And he said, I'm not, I, don't, I don't know when it's going to be. Only my Father in heaven knows when it's going to be. Because if I knew when it was going to be, I'd tell you. Because I, I, everything my Father tells me, I tell you. So the Father didn't tell the Son. Because <laughs> he doesn't want us to know. Why? Because if we don't know, it purifies us to some point. Because if we don't know, it means we have to be ready. Because it could be at any moment. So when I'm doing this thing, when I'm thinking these thoughts, when I'm acting these ways, if it reflects across my heart that Jesus might come and catch me doing that, then I began to question myself, do I really want to do this? Would this be something that I would want Jesus to catch me doing when he comes again? And if the answer is no, I wouldn't want Jesus to catch me doing this, then you need to walk away. That's a, that's a conviction of the Holy Spirit inside of you trying to purify your life by the thought of the fact that Jesus could come at any moment. You know, it's a, the, the purifying effect of immediate expectation is really what it is. I know that's a fancy group of words together, but that's what it is. It, uh, the, the fact that he could immediately, the expectation that he could immediately come purifies us. And if it doesn't, you're either crazy or you're not real, one of the two. If that thought doesn't influence what you do, then you either don't believe what you say or you've never done it before. One of the two. You be the judge. And at the end of the service today, you may need to pray the prayer, or you may need to pray it right now and say, Lord Jesus, I, don't, I never sense that. I never, I, that never crosses my mind. That's not something I live with. Then you need, you need to pray and ask him, Lord, come into my life. Save my soul. Change me because I obviously haven't bent my heart to God and I don't belong to him. 
So James would say, yay, that's exactly what I want. I want you to see yourself. He's pretty hard that way. Most of us would not feel comfortable being around James because James is not one of those people that would allow you to say you believe something. He would say, show me what you believe. Let me see what you believe. And it'd be a pretty tough row. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to us, old camel knees would put it on us hard. But here's what he says. He said, you know, in, in, in light of the fact that Jesus is coming, the first thing is you need to be patient. Yeah. And then he, then he used the word. Let me, let me show the verse. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and waiting patiently for, he, uh, for it until it receives the early and latter rain. And we said the two examples, he says, is be patient like a farmer who puts the seed in the ground and goes away and doesn't go out there every day and dig it up and get all anxious and nervous and, oh, fret and worried. Oh, is it going to come up? Is it going to come up? Oh, we'll never live without it. I mean, the farmer puts it in the ground. The farmer has faith that when he puts it in the ground, it's going to come up. There's no doubt in his mind that this seed is going to come up. It's just a matter of time. He puts it in the ground, and then he walks away from it, and he doesn't come back every day and dig it up and fret and worry and be anxious and nervous over whether it's coming up. It's going to come up. He has faith to believe that, and he says, just like that, you need to have faith that Jesus is coming. He's not come yet, but he's promised he'll come, so just be patient and allow God to do his work and don't be fretting and anxious and nervous and, 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 uh, and stewing about all of that because it's a bad testimony. It's almost like the Lord said it, but you don't believe it. Be patient. And then he used the farmer and the seasons. He said, you know, they come. The, the farmer knows that there are former rains and latter rains. In other words, uh, life has seasons in it, and there are seasons of time. And you are in a season right now. And some of you have good seasons, and then you have bad seasons, and then you have upset seasons, and you have seasons of, uh, of happiness and joy and seasons of sadness and sorrow. And life, you know, is made up of a bunch of seasons, you know, like early rain and latter rain. And Jesus called attention to seasons when he says to his disciples, say not that there are yet three or four months until harvest, yeah, yeah. but lift up your eyes and look at the fields which are white unto harvest right now. The fields are white. Don't say we need three or four more months before the, we harvest. The fields are ripe right now. <laughs> Just lift up your eyes and look at them. Yeah. Jesus was saying there were seasons, and the season is that the fields are ripe to harvest. Get out there and harvest souls. But he's trying to say. James says, in, in, in relationship to the return of the Lord, you as a child of God need to be patient because that testifies to the world that you believe what God said. And don't get cross and don't get angry and don't get get restless and don't get nervous and don't get anxious and don't be fretting over this and constantly stewing about this. Uh, trust God, just like a farmer does with the seed and know the seasons. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, this is verse 4, uh, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. <laughs> at the point when, when the time comes, He's going to come. The coming of the Lord is at hand, James says. He's got a plan, and he's going to come. And, and so this will establish your heart. The second thing you're going to do is be quiet. Do not murmur one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And then the two verses that I didn't get, and I want to just spend one second on this. Um, uh, he, he, he says, you know, be quiet, don't murmur, don't complain, quit, quit griping at each other, quit belly aching about things because um, when you do this, this is a bad word, this is a bad testimony. I know you get frustrated sometimes with the fact that Jesus hasn't come back. I know that it weighs on you that sometimes things aren't working out like you plan, but you can't start sniping and criticizing and belittling and looking for fault in each other. Because if you do this, this is going to be a repulsion to the people outside of you. Who wants to come into a church that is devouring itself? Unity in, this, in a body draws people. Unity in a body is a comfort. It's a, it, it makes people want to come in and say, 
these people love each other. These people are in line with each other. These people uh, are, not, are not evil people and, and, and disgruntled people and angry people and hostile people. These are not people looking for some reason to divide. They are people that understand that people have issues and people have directions and, and, and they are able to, to move within the, the spirit of God to draw them together to be one body. They respect each other. If you ask me, one of, the, one of the things that makes Freedom River Church different, and I believe it is different, and I know other pastors believe their churches are different also. I mean, if you're the pastor, you, I guess you should believe that. But believe me, I've pastored like eight churches in, my, in the whole ministry. I've pastored for 40, 43 years. I started when I was 18, so I've been around a long time. <laughs> And a lot of churches and country churches and city churches and big churches and small churches. And I've been on the mission field on three, uh, in three continents. And I, I've seen a lot of the things of God. I've seen, them work in, I've seen a lot of bodies of Christ. And I can say about Freedom River Church, man, this is a unique place. This is a place where I don't sense strife and division. Now, you know, I mean, we've had people that have come and gone here. We've had people that may, I'm assuming that they disagreed with something or had some kind of issue going some way that they would leave, uh, uh, but, but they didn't stir up any stink and then move away. We, we just looked her up and they were gone and you say, where, what happened to so-and-so? And nobody really knows. It's like, man, I don't know what happened to them. And then I say, well, you didn't say something to them? You didn't hurt their feelings? <laughs> no, I, nothing, you know. Well, that's, we just have to accept that as God moving the body of Christ where he wants it to be. And some of you are here because God draw, drew you here. And probably it should be all of you are here because of that. But we're, we're not to grumble and complain and murmur because the outside world is repelled by that. So, I mean, look at how this works together now. Keep, keep in mind what James is saying. James is saying, as you wait on the Lord, you are to be patient. Don't be anxious and nervous and fretting because the world is, is looking and the world is examining you. And also, don't be frustrated and aggravated so that you start sniping on each other and, and chewing on each other and, and, and become frustrated with each other because that's going to repel people away from you. So as you wait, be patient and keep your mouth shut. Quit complaining and quit, and, and, and quit griping. And then he used in verse 10, this is an example. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Well, there are four major prophets. And the reason, the reason God said to James, take the prophets as an example is because all of these people that would be listening to him were Jewish people that had trusted Christ. And as Jewish people, I know this may find, you may find this hard to believe, but as Jewish people, the schooling that they had was by use of the Torah, which, was, which are the first five books of the Bible, pretty much. I mean, they're the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the, the elementary school, they go, they start learning these books, and, and they learn word by word and line by line so that they can quote them. So to get out of elementary school or so, you know, basically you go in front of the rabbi and he starts questioning you about different passages and different actions. And, by, and if, if you can do it, then you, you're good and you, you, you might go on or you might be sent out to work in the fields with your family or whatever business your family's in. If you are the best of the best, then you go to the next level of schooling, which just opens up all of the prophets, all the books of history, and all the books of the prophet, which is the rest of the Old Testament. And, you, and then you're taught that, and you quote that, and then when you get to about, be about 12 years old or so, then you go before the rabbi, and he asks you questions, and you quote scriptures, and he draws them out, and you, you tell him, and you quote all these lines, and tell him everything. And if you do well, you're the best of the best. Then you go on. Maybe you're, maybe you're put under a certain rabbi, and you keep going. If not, you go out in the fields like all the other people and work in your family's business. So when James says to these believers here, take the prophets as an example, they knew what the prophets said. 
They knew what he was talking about. I know when you hear this, you say, yeah, I know the prophets. Go on, Pastor. But do you really know the prophets? Do you know the stuff they went through? I mean, why would, why would this be an example of perseverance? Well, it was because God required some very strange things of these prophets. I don't know how many of you have read, even read the books I mean, just the major prophets as example. I mean, don't the four major prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Daniel, and Isaiah, the four major prophets, much less the 12 minor prophets, but the four major prophets. I mean, just take an example. Many of you know because the scripture's famous of Daniel and the lion's den. God, 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 God re- let Daniel go into a lion's den. Now imagine that. Imagine what kind of uh, faith it took to believe that God was going to do what he said to do when all of a sudden you're being snatched and thrown down in a den of lions. Imagine what it was like to face a lion for God and, and what kind of thought about uh, God's deliverance Daniel would have had to have to not be kicking and screaming and wailing as he goes down in the lion's den. And, and, then, and then Darius, the king, that morning doesn't even really want to go over there and see what happened because he knows he's going to see a mangled mess down there and them chomping on the bones of Daniel, who he really loved and cared, but had been tricked into ordering a decree that caused him to be thrown down in there. And then he, and he opens and, yeah, the, uh, the door up and he looks down in there and he says, Oh, Daniel, is the God that you serve able to deliver you? And Daniel said, live on, O king. And man, the lion, I mean, he's laying on a lion, you know. He, he's chomping on a piece of straw saying, hey, it was a good night's sleep. Live on, king. Don't worry about me. God was able. And the king then took him out and threw all the accusers down in there. Think of what, the, that's, 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 the, that's the perseverance of one of those prophets. And then you, you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that were the prophets that went into the fiery furnace, you know, the boys that went in, Daniel's best friends. You say, what kind of people you hang around? Well, Daniel hung around people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were his buddies, and they walked into a furnace and walked with Jesus in a furnace because when they looked in there, <laughs> it was like, I thought you put three in. And he said, we did. He said, well, I see four guys walking around in there and one of them looks like the son of God which says to you if you want to walk with Jesus you got to get in the furnace all right many of us have never walked with Jesus because we avoid the furnace we skip that (laughs) but that's see that's what they would have known when James said take the perseverance of the prophets as an example of that Isaiah, I know you're probably not aware of this, but Isaiah had to, had, to, had to walk around naked for three years. Do you know this? Have you ever heard this before? It's in the book of Isaiah. God spoke to him and God said, all right, take off your shoes and take off your robe. And I know what you're saying. You're saying he wasn't really naked. He just took his prophetic mantle off. Well, that would be news to the people because they saw, the Bible says they saw his buttocks as he walked down the road. That's your behind for those of you that are not anatomy people. Which means to me that the word naked in Hebrew means the same thing as naked means in English. Right? Means no clothes on. Now imagine that. For three years he did this. Imagine that. He gets up every day. He comes down to the breakfast table and he eats his lentils and drinks his goat milk. And his wife looks at him and says, what do you plan to do today, honey? He said, well, i got to go down to the city square and proclaim the word of the Lord. And, he, and then he takes his robe off and takes his slippers off and walks out the door. And can you imagine the neighbor that lives next door to him? She's probably bringing her little child out to go to daycare and loading her up in the you know, baby stroller. And then here comes old man Isaiah out of the house going to work dressed in his birthday suit. Oh, my God, honey, don't look, you know, don't look, don't look. And that's the man of God? Now, imagine that. I mean, imagine what it took for, for Isaiah to be able to do that, and, and he did that for, for three years. I mean, my goodness, that was an amazing thing to do. And then, and then Ezekiel, <laughs> I just, you know, I, I reread this this morning and I wrote 
down a note here because I want to just make sure I say this to you right because this is so bizarre. It's weirdo. I mean, it's crazy. And I'm, I'm just trying to show you that when, Dad, when, that when James said, think about the prophets and think about the bizarre things they, that God let them live through and God commanded them to do. Think about what kind of faith it takes to believe God with these kind of things that God would say to you. And they just persevered and went through. I mean, we're talking about years of life. Not, not a day, not an hour, not a minute, but years of life. And they had to do it believing that God had a message in it and that it was going to further the kingdom of God. And so I, I think about Ezekiel, and, and, and Ezekiel had been sent to prophesy uh, the coming judgment of Israel, and he was, he was prophesying, it was, an, it was in Egypt, and, and, he, was, and he was told to build a, that, that he was told to get a concoction together and put so much of this and so much of barley and so much of lentils and so much, of, and, he, and, he, and to bake a barley cake. And then... He said, put, you know, God's given specific instructions. He said, uh, put two parts of a hen, one, pe- one part of an epheth, one. Part of, I mean, it's just a whole bunch of very distinct ingredients put in, put in, put in, put in, put in. And then at the end, he says, and oh, by the way, you need to cook this on human dung. Hello. Hello. I'm, sure Isaiah, I'm sure Ezekiel was writing down all the stuff, you know, and he said, all right. Uh, six part of a hen, uh, got that. Uh, one part, one epith of a barley, got that. One, uh, six, uh, you know, parts hen, uh, a variable. This. And then, and, and then he said, he gets that last thing. He said, and now, Lord, he said, what, what was that last thing you said? Uh, I want to make sure I got this right. Right, right. Dung, Ezekiel, dung, and not donkey dung or, or, or horse dung or cow dung or goat dung, but human dung. What? And <laughs> now tell me that they didn't have to persevere. Tell me they didn't have to trust God exclusively to live lives like this. Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, was told by God to put on a linen girdle, which is a linen belt type deal that they wore in those days, and it had some cloth built into it, and it was like a, you know, they, the Bible calls it a girdle, more likely, more it's closer to a belt with some, you know, with something attached. But but anyway, the point is, he, he said, all right, get you one, wear it out there in public. And then he did it, and then all of a sudden he says, all right, now take it to the Euphrates River and put it in, bury it in a hole. And then come on back home and wait a little while. And so then he waited a little while, waited a little while, waited a little while, and then God said, all right, go back and get that girdle. And he went back to get it, and when he got back there, of course, it was, you know, slimy and nasty and had mold growing on it, and it was rotten in some areas and all tattered. Now, put that back on. Let's walk in front of them now, and because that's how Israel looks to me. I mean, come on, guys. This is the perseverance of the prophets. And James says that's how, that's an example of how you have to live in in thoughts of the return of the Lord. And then he says about Job, look at this. Uh, uh, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. He said, take Job as an example. Well, we all know about Job, right? We know that Job uh, was a great man and a righteous man and a holy man and that God blessed him and that God, uh, you know, God uh, 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 allowed things to happen in his life because God was wrestling with Satan and Job was the battlefield. We all know that because in the first chapter we get to see it. The only, the only difference is Job didn't know that. Job knew nothing about this. Job was the one that just started to feel the things and his children were taken away and his money was taken away and his health was taken away and he was sitting on a garbage dump, scratching his old ulcerated skin where pus and stuff is pouring out with, with shells, scraping them, trying to get them clean so hopefully they would heal up. And, he, and, he, and he's sitting on the city garbage dump. 
And he had done nothing, and, and then God wouldn't answer his prayers, but his buddies came by, by. Bill, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar came by and said, come on, Job, we know that God's doing this because you're a sinner. Fess up, Job. Fess up. Come on, get right with God. Let it go, Job. Come on, man. You got to tell the truth. Be released in Jesus' name or whatever, you know. Whew. And they just constantly accused him all the way through the book, constantly chastised him all the way through the book. Job kept saying, I don't know, I didn't do anything. I don't have anything to repent for. What in the world is this? God, I wish I could get you in a court of law. You're not fair to me. And then in chapter 42, last chapter, Job got out on his knees. And the Bible says, Job prayed for his friends. God bless Eliphaz. Eliphaz doesn't know God. Don't lay it against his charge. He's trying to be a good friend. He just doesn't know. Lord, don't punish him because he's been saying these things against me. Lord, forgive Eliphaz and bless him and Bildad. Give him a righteous life. Lord, bless his family. Bring him up. Zophar, Lord, he's a good man. He just needs to know you in a better way. And don't hold this. And the Bible says when Job began to pray for his friends that God turned the captivity of Job. In other words, it broke God's heart when he saw Job praying for his friends. It was almost like... The, the contest between him and Satan fought in the battlefield of Job. God looked down and said, I can't take this anymore. Look at that man. Humble, self-sacrificing, praying for his friends who have abused him and mistreated him. And he's praying for them. That's it. I'm calling this thing off. And then he, the Bible says he blessed Job with twice as much as he had when he, when he started, doubled everything, the cattle, the oxen, the homes, everything but the children. Because one day when Job gets to heaven, they'll be doubled because he had, had three more and seven more sons and three more daughters. And in heaven, he'll have six sons and 14 daughters, and it'll all be right. Now, when, that's, what the, that's, what, that's Job. Take the prophets. Take Job. That's what I'm talking about, about being quiet and and being patient and, and, and hanging on while you, while you wait. Now, be honest. I'm going to just get this real quick. Uh, I will. I promise. I know. I hear some of you. All right. Be honest. Be honest. Look at here. But above all, my brethren, do not do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall in condemnation. This verse has been used, I think, from time immemorial to tell people. I mean, most people think this verse says that you're not supposed to swear. Like, I swear to God, you know. And some even people take it even so far as to say we're not supposed to get in a court of law and put our hand on the Bible and say, so help me God. But that's so ridiculous. I mean, that's so, that's so non what this verse is talking about. This verse is not saying, don't ever use the word swear to God. It's saying, it's saying that God won't, as you wait on the return of Christ, you need to be honest in other words, your words should be so true that you would never need to back them up with, I swear to God, or an oath of some kind, that your yes ought to mean yes because you're so honest. People know that you tell the truth and your no be no so that pe because people know uh, above all else that you are honest. Listen, he's saying as you wait on the return of the ultimate truth of God, which that's what Jesus is. Jesus is the ultimate truth of God. And as you wait on the return of the ultimate truth of God, above all else, my brethren, be honest. Yeah, yeah. Punch me in at the office. I'm going to be a little late today. Can you, can, you, can you punch me out? I need to leave a little early. The kids got a program at school. Well, I'm going to be a little bit late coming back for lunch. Can you cover me? You know, you, you know can you cover me. Speaking nastiness, uh, invoking um, dishonesty and, and deceit, and, and, then, and, then, and then you're going to invite them to church. You're going, you're going to take them to revival with you. You're going to say, come, come, come be like me. Come, come let my God change your heart so you can be like me. 
And they're not coming to your revival meeting and they're not going to your prayer meeting because above all, they don't want to be like you. You lying rascal. They avoid you. They say, man, I'm afraid I might become like you if I did go there. Bless God. And then you have the audacity to be surprised by this. The Lord said, while you wait, make sure that you are honest and people know that your yes means yes and your no means no so that you don't fall into condemnation. And the word condemnation there is used uh, to mean a comparison of you falling short by comparing you with somebody else that's so righteous. Somebody's so righteous, then you're compared to it and you are condemned because you obviously don't meet the measure. That's really what the word there means. And so James says, man, while you wait on the Lord, you know, you, you, you be honest about these things or else you're going to be condemned. And, and, and condemned here doesn't mean condemned to die and go to hell. It means condemned not to live the life that God has created you to live. Here's your condemnation. God's created you for a purpose. You are to accomplish that purpose. You're to live a life. That's why you're seeking God. That's why you're seeking the Lord, because you're seeking his purpose. And you are, you are wanting to walk with the Lord. Well, if, if you can't tell the truth, you're never going to be able to live the purpose that you were created to live. And this is a condemnation for you. You are condemned to stay where you are rather than moving on with God and live according to his purpose. All right, let's look at this last one, all right? So while we're waiting, we're to be patient. That means, you know, cool it, uh, be calm, be, be confident about God, uh, have your faith right there, be quiet, don't argue, be, present a, a, a united front, be uh, patient with each other and kind and keep your mouth shut and quit grumbling and griping and complaining and belly aching about stuff because you're, dr you're, you're running people away rather than drawing them in. And while you're waiting on the Lord to come and he's tarrying, he's not coming yet, he's giving you more time, just think about it this way. The more time he waits, the more time we have to win more people to Christ so that the kingdom gets bigger. That's our opportunity as we wait that, that we would have more time to win more people and they there would be more brothers and sisters that go to heaven with us when we die if we'll be patient, if we'll keep our mouths shut and not run them away by all of the criticism and harshness that we have, and if we'll be honest and not tell them the truth. I mean, think about it this way. Who is going to base their eternity on something that a liar says? Are, you tell me, punch you in at work, you cheat at work, punch you out at work, cover you, you know, do dishonest things, stretch the law, stretch the, I mean, take advantage of every little loophole, and then you're going to tell me about Christ and you expect me to believe you who lies about everything else to tell me the truth about how to be right with God? I mean, come on. Remember, James is telling us that true faith acts a certain way. True faith tells the truth, man. That's what I mean. And you don't have to be mean and ugly and harsh. You don't have to be, you know, you know. I just tell the truth. I just like straightforward. Yeah, and, and, and you are critical and harsh and, and, and immature too. But I'm supposed to admire you because you tell the truth? Come on, get your life straightened out. Remember who we are. Remember what our purpose is and be, and be patient and don't start swearing because you just be honest and people will look at you and your yes will be yes and your no will be no. And then be witnessing, which is a natural uh, closing to everything. Do you know many of the books, most of the books in the Bible end with some kind of admonition to win the lost, to seek the world, to spread the gospel, to build the kingdom. But look at what he says in verse 19, 20. These are the last two verses of the book, by the way. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sin. Now, let me just examine this with you one second because uh, it really, you know, and I know, I know many of you are, are not theological thinking people and it doesn't matter to you all of the intricacies of what theologians have said about this, these verses. But this has been a real controversial little section of the book of James because theologians think too much. Theologians argue too much about 
minor things that I think sometimes they just they miss the real picture of what it is. And, and believe me, I'm not trying to be critical of theologians because, you know, they examine the Word of God. But I'm just saying that uh, it, this appears to me to be very simple to see what James is saying. First of all, the argument is if, if he's talking about, I mean, these verses are obviously talking about, uh, about salvation. I mean, look at the phrases that are there. Uh, uh, someone turns him back, converts him, is what the old King James says. That's a salvation word, convert him. Uh, let him know that he who turns a sinner, that's a conversion word, that someone is a sinner from the error of his way. Save a soul from death, that's a conversion thought. And then cover a multitude of sins, that's a conversion. What covers the multitude of sin? Uh, uh, what, can, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I mean, those are salvation thoughts. But then because he uses the word brethren, and every other use of the word brethren in the whole book, which is many times, he's talking to them as brothers in the faith. Brothers who are part of a church, that are part of the, the body there. And so now he's saying that some of those brothers may be lost. Some of those brothers may need to be saved. Well, sure, that's what he's saying. You say, oh, what? You mean somebody got saved and then they got lost again and they need to be resaved? No. no, I'm just saying that some of you sitting in the church aren't saved to start with. And James knew that. James knew that everybody that he was writing to that was part of some church didn't know the Lord. I mean, what's the whole book of James about? The whole book of James is about knowing the difference between real faith and phony faith. The whole book is about examining yourself so that you are part of the faith. Look at your life. Faith without works is dead being alone. That's what the whole book's about. So in the last couple of verses of the book, don't you think James might be saying to them, look, you brothers in the church, look around and look at the people sitting beside you in the pews and look at the people that are standing up and clapping their hands and waving their arms and look at their life. Are they reflecting salvation? If they're not, you need to pay attention to them and try to convert them so that their life will be saved. Don't let your brothers sitting in the body of believers with you, your brethren... Don't let them die and go to hell because you're, you're not paying attention to what works and faith are all about. I mean, uh, now if that's not what it means, then, well, so be it. But that's what I believe it means because that's so true about our life. And so I'm asking, you know, I mean, the connotation is, are we real? Do we really know the Lord? And so as we wait on the return of Jesus, see it all works together, be patient as you wait, and then that patience is going to open some doors of opportunity, and then you protect the fellowship because the unity of the fellowship is going to draw people in, and then you be honest with your testimony so that when you tell them something, they will believe what you say so in the time you're waiting, be patient and be quiet and then be, be honest. And then some of these people will start listening to you about what you say about Christ so that they can have a relationship with God. So while you're waiting for the return of Jesus, which surely is going to come, this is what you do and this is how you behave. All right, let's bow our head. Just one.